पाजो गोबिंद पूल मात जा मान से जानम का ए ला पजो गोबिंद पूल मात जा मान से जानम का ए ला गुर सेवा ते भगत कमाई तब ये मान से दे पाए इस दे को सिमर देव सो दे पज हर की सेव सो दे पज हर की सेव भजो गोबिंद फूल मात जा मान से जानम का ए ला okay welcome everyone and um, i hope you're keeping well during this time of the ongoing covid pandemic and are able to take this valuable opportunity to make or seek true spiritual progress this subject of today's talk is titled the truth about the mind and is subtitled the concept of free will and choice now this is quite a large topic so a lot of information has been included in this satsang but it's been made concise so i'm hoping that it won't be too much for you but it will be slightly longer than a normal satsang now for those unfamiliar with the concept of a spiritual discourse let me explain that this brief talk will be given in the form of a satsang which simply means associating with the truth and this is the eighth in the series of our monthly talks or satsang designed to elevate the listener towards higher spiritual truth now this elementary discourse is primarily intended for those who are new to the spiritual path of high spirituality but may also be helpful to those followers who need further reminding before i begin this talk however i would first like to say a few words of introduction to you everything i shall share with you today is a gift of wisdom direct from the lord itself for the sincere seekers of high spiritual truth as for myself I am a simple messenger, a disciple on the path of the holy truth, who has been asked to share this holy truth with you. And although I shall speak with the authority of one who has been instructed to do so by the supreme lord and the holy masters of today, please do not attempt to praise or glorify this humble messenger in any way, for you too are all divine beings undergoing a human experience. in this lifetime though you may not yet be aware of this therefore what is given to me freely by the highest authority i give to you the same in return i only ask that you open your heart and mind to the holy message that the supreme lord has to offer you following the brief satsang there will be a question and answer session which the main uk speaker who has been an advanced spiritual practitioner for over 25 years shall answer thus he is able to answer any question one may have about true spirituality which today comprises a list of questions to answer from our many listeners and members thank you now let's now begin with the satsang the topic of today's discourse relates to the subject of the mind what is it and how does it operate to convince us of its greater reality than that of our soul indeed how does it block our awareness of the true reality that exists beyond the mind itself to answer these important questions we'll have to start with the origin of the mind 
from a purely spiritual perspective, which will be followed by looking at the concept of free will and choice itself and how they operate in human beings. Let's start with the mind. Now it must be explained that the familiar mind element of our being that we so identify with today is not in fact our true reality. It is simply the source and embodiment of our perceived identity or adopted character known as Jiva that we are so proudly identified with and thus wholeheartedly follow today. Yet it is an imposter, a clever deception that I shall reveal to you today and is thus not our true or everlasting identity known as soul or atma. Indeed, the imposter mind that we follow today skillfully masks our true identity, the soul, in order to fulfill its illusory function. How and why this happens shall be explained shortly. Meanwhile, our true self, the soul, is the glorious essence of the divine, noble, wise and infinitely great in every way, emanating high from beyond the level of our adopted mind, from a region known as the Kingdom of Truth or Supreme Consciousness in the fifth realm of creation. In contrast, the individual mind, our assumed character, that we have become so attached to, which, as we have learned, is not our true identity, actually originates as a phantom character in the great play of the divine from the much lower second realm of creation, the realm of illusion and thoughts termed the causal realm, as an attachment to our soul, simply in line with our soul's desire for adventure. This mystery will be explained shortly. Meanwhile, the second realm of creation itself locates just above the first realm of sense perceptions termed astral realm, in the grand hierarchy of creation. Now, as the realms of creation were fully explained in the second spiritual discourse of this series, which described the structure of creation beyond our known physical or zero realm, there is no need to repeat all that here, so let's continue. As was explained in earlier discourses, the reason why our divine soul is associated with an illusory mindset or character today is that our soul, in the sheer spirit of adventure and possibilities, left its true home in the fifth realm of creation, known as Satlok or High Kingdom of Truth, for an adventure into lower truth and ignorance, simply for the experience of it, because it can. This adventure includes the well-known spiritual regions of our current universe, heavens and hells, angels and demons, deities and holy masters and so on. Indeed, all the stuff of illusory creation that we already know or have heard about today. However, as a safeguard for our daring soul, an agreement was made with the soul's origin, our divine creator Satpurush, that religions term as Heavenly Father or Almighty God, etc., to be rescued when the soul gets weary of its adventure and wants to return home, no matter how lost the soul may be in the wonder of illusory creation. Therefore, the soul is fearless in its deception, in its, in its adventure and into the possibilities of illusory existence. Furthermore, as a drop of the divine ocean of Satnam or True Lord, the soul cannot be harmed in any way by its adventure, and so goes forth into the unknown willingly. It's all part of the great marvel of creation that has already been explained in earlier discourses. So let's continue from there. Going back to the illusory mind element of our being, let's look at how the mind itself works the structure of the mind is much like that of a cloud or smoke, ever-changing and subtle, and is neither male nor female, but carries both traits at its source. Its average lifespan is one to three million Earth years, and so many lives in the astral form and the physical form 
can be cycled in just one lifetime of one's mind or character. And once completed, the soul is ready to depart from the mind. Therefore, upon the soul's weariness of its adventure, a great rescue is mounted by the Supreme Lord, via Holy Master, Perfect Saint or Noble Mystic here on earth, which indeed is the entire difference between true spirituality and the mainstream religions of the masses. Now for those who wish to know a little more about the marvel of the illusory mind itself that so convincingly traps us in its illusory web of drama and adventure, let's take a closer look. In its primary function, the mind is responsible for our thinking ability and operates much like a computer here on earth. It is programmed by the law of karma or destiny and merely follows the script that accompanies our chosen character in a great play of the divine, which like any other character in a play is unreal and temporary. Yet we have forgotten all that since we came into the lower creation of adventure and illusion. Our mind therefore is nothing more than a cunning design of illusion termed Karl by the Holy Masters, and Karl itself is an illusory power that is the source of lower creation, <coughs> who is otherwise known as Satan, Mara or Devil by various religions, although Karl as an individual mind itself is simply a prearranged antagonist to the soul, and so is not actually evil. Indeed, without Karl, all the negative or all the positive adventures and dramas we came to experience in lower creation would not exist. Thus, we could not undergo our journey of adventure in illusion that we chose to experience for a while. So, one should not get too bogged down by this point, since we freely chose to come into the realm of illusion for an adventure, as explained earlier, which entailed picking up an evolving character to play along with along the way. Since the mind is a simple tool of illusion, pre-programmed by the destiny of the character we are playing, that is gradually evolving over time, this means that the mind is just like a parrot that can be trained and influenced by the company and environment it keeps. Now in order to fulfill this evolving role, the mind has three levels of existence termed gross, meaning physical or material expression, subtle, meaning sensory or intellectual expression, and causal, meaning creative or spiritual expression, that variously combine to form the nature of that individual mind or character. What's more, at its highest point, the mind also houses the store of our karmas or destiny, known as the Akashic Record, that is dispensed in line with karmic law and around which individual lifetimes are created and acted out accordingly. This is what is meant by the scripture saying, first the script is written, then we take birth to fulfill it. However, the human mind's primary function is that of thought and imagination, which it simply expresses through passive, intellectual or fantasy attitudes and behavior that together provide the elements needed to function in the lower realms, meaning the impure zero to second realms of creation. The balance of these elements also creates our character's nature in each lifetime. Thus, the mind is the source of the much talked about ego, our mind's identity, that we as human beings are so attached to. Among the ego's many attributes, is its habit of creating distinctions and preferences between one thing and another, as well as for other beings in creation. It also creates desires for lower or base activities, which are then fed to the senses for our indulgence. But what we don't realize is that despite our enjoyment of all this, there is a consequence for the ignorant misuse of this facility which results from both the decisions we make and the intentions behind them. Negative consequences can include personal suffering, poor health, tragedy, failed relationships, financial problems, confusion, 
fears, loneliness and much more, as well as having to take future births in lower species to match our level of behaviour today, or we may even have to visit one of the hell regions after death to clear persistent or heavy karmas as a result. Let's now take a closer look at exactly how the mind functions in lower creation, i.e. from the second realm down to our physical realm. For example, why do some people display good qualities and others bad qualities as we see them? And why do both seem helpless in this expression? Why do some people become sincere seekers of spiritual truth and others not? Indeed, how does the ego mind have such a powerful effect on our soul and so on? The mind itself is a lower conscious expression or tool of the soul that only exists in the lower illusory realms of creation. And just like God, the totality of all minds is cosmic in origin, operating everywhere at the same time, from the second realm down to the zero realm. This means that in reality there is only one universal mind, originating from its source at the top of the second realm, yet it is projected into many individual minds and has the ability to create in a similar way to God's creative power, though greatly inferior in quality and ability of course. Furthermore, the universal mind known as Karl is a tool and is also a faithful servant of its own master, Mahakal, the ego attribute of the Lord, who resides in the fourth realm of creation, the subject for another time, that if we remember is one of the original 16 attributes of the Supreme Lord that had to manifest separately in order for the creation to come into being as separate from the Supreme Lord. The ego attribute, therefore, is designed to impart wholly impure, illusory experiences to visiting souls of its domain and to then challenge them with consequences for their indulgences therein, which we call karma in lower creation. And this is the great adventure that our soul has curiously embarked upon. But exactly how and why do individual souls get trapped in their chosen adventure? The answer is very simple. Individuated minds, in the form of ego eyes or characters, that are just concepts initially, naturally become activated or alive by currently embodying descending souls who enter their domain in the second realm. But only after those souls have each chosen a particular story or mindset to participate in, from the great storehouse of adventures located at the very bottom of the third realm, bordering the second realm. Thus, an individual mind or ego becomes alive with an identity only when empowered by its host soul, as the mind itself has no power of its own to act. Now despite this arrangement, the soul knows that it cannot be truly harmed by its chosen adventure and that it will eventually be rescued. Hence it has no fear. However, through the ongoing process of descending into ever deeper states of illusion, the soul enters into slumber and forgets its true origin, thus over time gets trapped and lost in lower creation. Furthermore, this new soul mind or causal identity inherently starts to create desires, good and bad, which naturally weigh it down still further until it descends into the realm of the senses, the first realm of creation, which likewise karmically attach themselves to the already established causal mind to form or to become a new soul mind senses form or astral being that further expands its range of experiences through newfound emotions. Then, as sensual indulgence takes place, so does this new form create even deeper, gross consequences, which weigh it down still further, until it sinks low enough to then have to take birth in the physical form, through adopting the physical body of a relevant species according to its merits or karma. Now this is where the real trouble and indeed eventual rescue or grace both start. 
Hence we are here today. So to summarize how all this happens, let me explain the true marvel of it all. The ego attribute, being of the essence of the true or supreme Lord, though negative in its expression, can imitate the Supreme Lord, its creator, in its ability to play God, except that in this case, by not having the other attributes to support it, only illusions or mental expressions can be created rather than actual truth. Hence we say it is negative or evil in its deception. Still, in order to fulfill its natural role and expression, the ego attribute creates the illusory mind element or universal mind or Karl that is able to separate itself to form the individual minds or ego identities that we all know about based upon individual stories or adventures, a factor of the mind that mimics the creation of souls. But unlike souls, these egos are not alive. They are initially just inactivated mental illusory characters in the soul's chosen adventure story that only become alive and expressed by the presence of the soul. The soul allows this to happen by suspending awareness of its own truth momentarily in, tr in soul terms in order to truly enjoy the character's activities of the adventure it has chosen. Therefore, they mo the moment a normally dormant individual mindset or ego awakens, meaning becomes alive by attaching itself to a soul, the robot-like consciousness of that individual mind also operates instantly, and then maintains a self-identity or ego for as long as it is attached to a soul. So, the individual mind that is attached to our soul thus becomes our new identity, due to the soul's initial will to have another type of experience or temporary experience in soul terms which much like an actor here on earth who wants to play a drama role on the stage such as a hero or a villain etc for entertainment takes on that role. Now although the role is untrue and unreal the actor has to get into character to make it work. Similarly so does a soul do the same. Thus, the whole region of mind is just like a stage, created out of Karl or Universal Mind's remarkable imagination, much like a fantasy or virtual reality of character and story here on Earth. The mind derives its authority and power directly from the negative ego attribute that itself resides at the top of the fourth realm, from where it projects itself. Uniquely, it resides at a lower level than that of the other attributes of the Supreme Lord because it fell from grace a very long time ago through its desire to create its own mockery realms, meaning the fourth realm down to the zero realm, in order to satisfy its special need for love and worship. Yet, it is still one of the original 16 attributes or sons of the Supreme Lord mentioned earlier that is designed to give souls a new and unenlightened experience of existence via the realms of illusion, just for the soul's adventure entertainment. Hence, from the Lord's point of view, this attribute is a marvel of illusion and deception, and is not actually evil, though we see it today as a battleground of good versus evil. Meanwhile, its lesser form, known as Karl or Time, is responsible for the karmic realms zero to second, by which individual destinies of participating characters are fulfilled. Having now established how and why humans function here on earth, we must next address the issue of free will. To what extent do we have true free will? What about our choices in life? Is that not an expression of free will? Well, as we have seen, our Supreme Lord is the creator of this grand creation from the fifth realm down with all its trials and adventures. Our Lord has created man in its image to represent the nobility of God on earth and so on as it says in the scriptures. Now if our Lord is the absolute creator of everything both seen and unseen including all the dramas and scripts that exist in creation 
along with the divine law which all creation must follow, and that none exists bar God in different forms anywhere, then how can even an atom claim to have true free will, let alone human beings? This fact bears thinking about when we ask this important question. For example, in the Bible it is written that even the hairs of the body are numbered. And Guru Nanak of the Sikh faith also says, not even a leaf moves without his order. Even a leaf is given the order of when to move. So how can we say that we have true free will? In Buddhism, it says, similarly says, there can be nothing absolutely free in this world, physical or mental, as everything is conditioned and relative. The Quran says, no calamity befalls the earth or in yourselves that is not inscribed in the book of decrees before we bring it into existence. Now let me explain further. If we had true free will, we would not have been part of this physical realm today. We would have naturally remained within the spiritual realms or with our Creator. Indeed, nobody consulted us before being sent into the physical realm, and nobody consulted us about our country of birth, our parentage, the environment of our upbringing, our schooling, our religious belief or background, our number of brothers and sisters, or even about our inherent health problems, etc. Yet all these things go a long way to condition our mind to think in a certain way and to act in a certain way. And when linked with our given choice of friends and relationships, within the atmosphere of the environment we live in, this moulds our thinking into what we have today. Thus we behave accordingly. Look around at the different societies who have been indoctrinated with differing beliefs and thus never question the truth or origin of their beliefs to see how easily human beings who are unenlightened are conditioned by the society they live in. In many cases, they are also taught not to question their current beliefs or culture, nor to strive to be even better or a more noble human being than the society they live in may allow. Indeed, it takes a great and courageous man or woman in any society to question the truth of the society they live in or the culture they are born into may to follow. Thus, when there are so many things that are not in our control, accompanied by the inherent characteristics we are given, how can we say that we have true free will, or that we can even make the right choices, freely and fairly? At best, we have only apparent free will, meaning we make choices based upon our conditioning. But from the higher perspective, there is no free will at all, as the script has already been written and now must be played out accordingly. Indeed, many past masters have often said that we are just dancing to the tune of our karmas, like puppets. Karmic law is pulling our strings and hence we are dancing. But still, we boastfully take the credit for it, through ignorance. They further say that the whole creation is just a play of the divine, and so is merely an illusion that we take part in, according to our karmas. What's more, we do all this within the framework of linear time, which means that time at this level only runs in straight lines, forwards or backwards. While beyond the realm of mind and maya, time is actually non-linear, timeless and spaceless. Also, the amazing truth is that time itself does not move at all. Only we and all other life forms move along the pre-created timeline of events called destiny or karma to fulfill the roles we are playing during our journey through creation that may appear to represent moving time. But what does it all mean for us? To summarize, if we and all creation are simply part of God itself, functioning under God's fixed law, then how is it possible to have free will? Even top scientists in the field of mathematics, metaphysics and genetics can see that our cosmic laws do not allow for the concept of true free will. Furthermore, all enlightened masters actually say 
that true free will cannot exist because our material self is not the real self. So, if the material self is illusion, then its so-called free will is illusion too. Therefore, although we may have the illusion of free will, we do not have it in reality. To test this idea, try using your so-called free will to stop thinking completely for just five minutes. You'll find it impossible, even for 30 seconds. So where is your free will then? On this point, holy masters and top scientists seem to agree. So now, what actually is karma or destiny and how does it affect our apparent freedom of choice? Karma is another term for retribution, which means justice or even destiny. As Jesus Christ once said, whatever a man sows, so shall he reap. This clearly refers to karmic retribution and simply means that for every thought or deed, there will be a consequent reaction for thoughts and deeds create a ripple in the very fabric of creation. Therefore, whatever we think or do in life carries a consequence, either good or bad. This consequence may be met in this lifetime or may be carried forward into the next, depending upon the stack of karmas already waiting to be delivered, but it is never forgotten. We call this retribution in a next life or fated life destiny. So, despite this dilemma, can we truly help ourselves in any way? Well, surprisingly, through using the concept of conditioned choices, meaning choices based upon our karmic circumstances, coupled with that of our inherent characteristics, the answer is either yes we can right now, or yes we can in time. Depending upon the level of spiritual consciousness and sincerity, of the one who is asking. More will be spoken about this at another time, but choices are based upon our conditioning. It must be known that choice is not free will, it's simply based upon conditioning. And the difference between free will and choice is this, if you enter a room and you are truly thirsty, and you want simply water, but the host only offers you tea or coffee. You have to make a choice. Your free will is immediately eliminated because there is no water available for you to have. Now you make a choice. But how do you decide between tea or coffee? Well, even this is not free because it is not based upon absolute truths. It is based upon your favoritism and your conditioning. So life and your DNA has conditioned you to prefer a particular thing. So let's say you choose T, purely based upon that. So the choice is conditioned and no free will exists at all. So this is an important um, fact in the whole point about recognizing free will and choice. So the best thing is just to go along with it and do the best you can with the knowledge that you have available. But as you evolve, the wisdom increases and better choices can be made. So more again will be spoken about this point another time but if one is truly ready to act now for their betterment to inquire further about how they can escape the trap of illusion that they're currently playing as character of the stage of creation then the lord surely will help them if they are sincerely now that ends this longer but important discourse for today i understand that there are some questions from the sangat so let's now proceed with those. Thank you. Thank you. Just to go over the title again. The Truth About the Mind. Subtitled, The Concept of Free Will, Choices, Our Human Predicament. The first set of questions I've got relate to the mind. What is the best explanation to describe the existence of the mind? We've already given quite a lengthy satsang about it. But the basic gist of it is that the mind is an illusory tool created by the soul to have an adventure in an illusory creation for the fun of it. And when that is all done, then the soul packs up and goes home. And this going home process involves a rescue. So there's a whole adventure and drama associated with the mind. And a true seeker of the highest truth does not 
take the mind too seriously, but seeks to go beyond the mind to find out their true reality, which is why all holy masters say this one thing, know thyself as soul. They do not say know thyself as mind. So that's the importance of the difference. Thank you. How many parts are there to the mind? Well, there are three basic parts of the mind. There's the lower or gross mind, which is the emotional mind. Then there's the intellectual mind or middle mind. And then there's spiritual mind or higher mind. And for the purposes of a spiritual aspirant, it is the spiritual mind that we're interested in stimulating. Because by having all these talks, discourses, association, this is all for the mind. It's all to design to awaken the spiritual mind that then starts questioning its existence and life itself and so on and wants to find the answers itself. Because of this unique aspect of the mind, we are able to go home, we are able to transcend the mind. Because first we win the mind over through convincing it that there's more to life than the lower expressions of itself. And when we reach that level, then we invoke the grace of the Lord through a master to pull us out. In other words, we can't use our own mind to escape the existence of the mind. We need some a power to pull us out of it. So that's where, say, a holy master or a perfect saint or the holy teachings come into play, where a being had to manifest here on earth, create disciples or followers, and then pull them back home. So those are the, essentially the parts of the mind, and all teachings are geared towards stimulating spiritual mind or higher mind. Thank you. Why does our mind feel so powerful over the soul? Again, because the soul has willingly suspended its knowledge and truth to allow the tool of the mind to create an identity that the soul happily goes along with for the time being until it grows weary. So the, the, the mind itself is just a pre-programmed character that the soul picks up in order to have an adventure in creation. So the mind actually doesn't have any power. The only reason the mind has power is because the soul allows it. If the soul allows it to have power, then the mind plays its part and the soul goes along with it. But, as was said in the satsang, once the soul gets weary of the whole plan and says, I've had enough, I want to go, then immediately the rescue is mounted. And we call this rescue plan you know, divine intervention. So suddenly, the Lord manifests the Holy Master for us, we get attached to it, the Master stimulates our higher mind, the spiritual mind we spoke about a moment ago, creates an interest in the mind to follow that being, and at first that mind doesn't understand who it is that's sitting in front of it. They just say, oh, this is somebody great, it appeals to our higher understanding, we like it, so we love it, and all the emotions are engaged, everything. But it's only when we cross the level of mind and Maya, and we attach permanently to that representative of the Lord, that we actually realize what that was and the whole gameplay. And, uh, and then we become so fascinated by that and we just go back home. Will the mind accept defeat gracefully? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, the mind is a pre-programmed tool and as a pre-programmed it is designed to keep on going indefinitely, forever. And it doesn't want to change the programming. Mm. So the only way is to get out of the level of the mind now in that programming, there is um, a certain time when the mind starts becoming a seeker. The whole thing is prearranged, even the time of the rescue is prearranged. And at the time that the soul becomes weary, also the mind itself steps up the game and starts seeking higher truth. It itself gets weary and it wants to know its own source and where does it come from, why it exists. You see, so at that point, that's when the rescue plan can be mounted and the soul helps, the mind helps the soul initially to get to the level of the top of the mind and then the soul humbly departs from the mind and leaves the mind there and the moment the soul leaves the mind it becomes dormant, inactive. Like you unplug the computer, it's dead. No matter how big and great that computer was, how much it could powerfully could compute, it's nothing without the electricity. The soul itself is the powerhouse of the mind. So immediately the mind falls dormant and it doesn't know anything. Thank you. When we become a seeker, which part of the mind is actually seeking? Again, it's the spiritual mind, the higher mind that we spoke about earlier. That's the mind that all of this, these meetings, the masters, the books, the satsangs, the shabbats, everything that you witness with your senses is geared towards, not the soul. This is nothing for the soul. The soul has a completely different way of operating. 
these are for the mind itself. Once the higher mind is won over, the higher mind itself curbs the lower mind, the emotional mind, and then defeats the intellectual mind through intuition. And it's at that point that the soul takes charge then, because there's only a limited covering upon the soul. So the soul now is able to pull the character through the master out of the realm of the mind without causing harm. Masters very beautifully put it like this. Imagine you have a silk cloth of a thorny bush. If you pull it all at once, you rip the cloth to shreds. But if you unpick it thorn by thorn, gently, you can remain intact. And that's exactly why this process occurs. Because if one is functioning in lower mind and suddenly they're pulled through all the elements of mind, it would be so traumatic for that individual, it, they, they would become mentally disturbed and deranged. So masters try to do this as gently as possible and in the eyes of the Lord there's no rush. <laughs> there's no rush for anything. Everything is done just as it, as it needs to be done, at the pace it can be dealt with. Thank you. I've got a question now for our guest speaker. Mm. And the question is, why do a lot of people like listening to mindfulness techniques instead of seeking the higher path? Because um, the higher path is very rare to come across. So most of the spiritual teacher in the world, they mostly teach mindfulness technique. But uh, as my experience, I also think that mindfulness is also good for preparation, but it's not the ultimate. Mm. It prepares us to get to the Wisdom Eye Center. But in order to access and withdraw from Wisdom Eye Center, we need a perfect living master to activate that. So therefore, in order to have a perfect liberation, we need to seek a higher part, which is the part of the soul, not the mind. Thank you. The last question relating to the mind in this section. What happens to the mind when the soul has become enlightened and all-knowing? The plug is pulled mm. <laughs> and the mind becomes dormant. That is the simplest answer to that. Thank you. Right, we're going on to free will now. Three questions relating to this. What is conditioned free will? As I said in the satsang, conditioned free will is a way of explaining a type of free will that the mind can understand. So conditioned free will means that there are conditions placed upon the ability to make free will. An example I gave in the satsang is this. If you go into a room and you want a glass of water because you're thirsty, but the host only offers you tea or coffee. Now you have a condition set upon your free will. Because if you had true free will, you'd have the water. You could manifest the water and have it. You could have anything you want, but we don't. We have a wish or a desire, and then circumstances are placed, and we have to make a choice out of our lot, whatever is given to us. As they say, whatever cards are dealt in the hand, we have to make choices. We call this conditioned free will. Because or, or conditioned choices because it, it's not actually real. It's a mockery of the free will concept. But for the lower mind, which is emotional mind, who's not intellectual and doesn't think too deeply about these things, it's happy to go along with the idea that it's making choices because it gives it some measure of control when it compares itself to the animals in creation, the plants and even the furniture in the room. So it thinks, ah, at least I'm something. So it's satisfied with that. But as the intellect revolves and it starts questioning it and saying, well, the scientists question the whole concept. They say, well, not even an atom has free will. So, but they, because they can't comprehend that everything, they're, that everything every choice they're making is destined, then they, uh, they just leave it. They don't want to entertain that because it's just too much for them. But they at least get the idea that there's a possibility there. And for spiritual aspirants or people who are spiritually awakened, they fully know that uh, and understand and comprehend the, the, the example I've given, the difference between free will and, and choices, conditions, choices. Thank you. I think you've already answered this second question, but I'll ask it again. Why do we not use our free will stroke choices in the right way? Because based upon the inherent characteristics we're born with and our level of spiritual attainment, we make choices based upon what we know now. It, should our um, circumstances improve or our knowledge base increase, 
that we make ever wiser choices. So it's not that we're stuck in a particular choice making uh, episode and we have no way out. Otherwise we'd never evolve, we'd never improve. By learning, through the concept of learning and the right environment and so on, we're able to condition our minds to make better conditioned choices. That's how it works. Mm. I think you know the answer to this one as well. Is it true that ultimately we have no free will as everything good or bad that we do is in our script? Yes, basically that's the case as we've explained already. Right. Next few questions are around cow, which is a negative power. And um, just so everyone knows, you can also interject if you've got a question that relates to what we're talking about as well. Right, Carl. Is Carl, i.e. the negative power, a devoted soul to the Lord? Most definitely so. Mahakal, or the origin of Kal itself, is one of the original 16 attributes of the Lord. And as one of this original 16 attributes, it has a unique function to play so that creation could manifest. And um, it is known as the ego attribute. Without the ego attribute of the Lord, remember it's a manifestation of divine divinity itself, the entire illusion of creation could not exist. So this one out of the 16 attributes is responsible for the entire illusion that we're witnessing today. So, um, and the reason is, the reason the Mahakal won this favor is because, as it is written, he did 70 yugas of austerity towards the law, 70 yugas of praise. And they say in classic Indian text, although it's not how it happened, he stood on one leg for 70 yugas. And bearing in mind, yugas are very long periods of time. So he did this for a very long period, and hence the creation was granted to him for a very long period of time. In fact, for 311 trillion Earth years before the creation's folded, if you want to be exact to measure it. Um, so he has been granted this boon, this blessing of creation for this long period. And therefore, he created the lower realms, each with their own presiding lord or ruler, and each with their own rules and laws. In which, that, but then he had no souls, because he, although he is the attribute of the Lord, only Sat Purush, the supreme Lord, could create souls. So again, he did another seventy yugas of austerity and devotion to have some play souls to play with to populate his realms. So that's how the creation came into being by, by the Supreme Lord. So the ego attribute by direction of the Supreme Lord and with full support runs this creation in, in an illusory way. And then souls who are living in such Khan, some of them we call Hun souls, let's say they're the adventurous ones, they decide let's have an experience that is different from perfection. We want to know what it's like to go from absolute knowledge and perfection to ignorance, darkness and imperfection, just because we can. So then soul descend into Carl's domain in order to have an experience that is different from that of its perfection state in such Khan. And in fact, more so than that, the soul realizes on its way back the wonderment of its own specialness and divinity and it enjoys that all the more so even for the soul when it enters into creation it thinks it's having adventure and having fun but it finds it more fun discovering its truth slowly and gradually as it turns home so this is an unexpected bonus for the soul so when the soul these hun souls return home they're jumping in joy more so than the bun souls who reside there and the bun souls who reside there saying you know what's so happy said ah oh, we're, we're glad we're back home. You know, we've been through an experience here and uh, the wonderment of the discovery, I cannot even explain to you. You have to experience it. So it's a way for the Lord to enjoy its own glory and power even more. Because the Lord manifested his creation to worship itself and to express itself <coughs> infinitely in infinite forms. By infinitely creating different modes of, uh, uh, of existence, and then infinite souls to experience it from every angle, the infinite Lord can experience infinite wonders by, from infinite angles. It's a, it's a wonderful creation, and, and you have to be there to understand the importance of that. Thank you. 
Is Carl the only one that can judge our actions? And if so, will this be at the end of our lifetime? Carl, again, in the creation of karmas and illusions, there's a system of justice in place. So the justice system rules. And the justice system really runs in the first realm of creation or the astral realm. And there's two levels of this answer. I'm going to, I'm going to try and answer both. I know this is a beginner satsang, but let, let me put some little spanner in the works and give an advanced point of view. From the beginner's point of view, yes, you know, we have a destiny. We make choices, yeah, these conditioned choices, and then we go out and get a consequence of these choices. And this consequence is met out in the Dharamraj court on the first realm of creation where King Judge of Dharamraj, he then looks over our entire life and weighs accordingly our good and bad merits and then decides our fate. On the one hand, when looking at it from the human perspective, when looking at it from the higher perspective, we make the judgment ourselves. Because we judge what is right and wrong and we believe in the judgment system, therefore we bring about the entire court to judge us. So, from a spiritual point of view, the easy way out is to leave the justice system. If we leave the justice system by no longer having faith in it, which means, which the saints demonstrate admirably, they judge no one, curse no one, condemn no one, criticize no one, see nothing negative in creation, they only see wonder, then such a being, how can they be judged? If they do not believe in the justice system, if they do not subscribe to the justice system, no power on earth can judge them. Thank you. As we are in Dwapa Yuga, now will Carl become less active or will it be the opposite where he is trying to tempt more souls into sin? It, it works differently. Um, in um, in, Kal, in um, Dwapa Yuga, yes, Carl becomes more clever in his activities. Whether you say he's more active because he's always earnest in trying to keep souls trapped in creation for as long as possible, because that's his role. Um, he becomes more clever in his deception in Dwapa Yuga, I would say, rather than more active. In Kal Yuga, it's very easy because there's so much suffering in creation and Carl can use that as a weapon against the truth saying yes if there is a God why are you suffering then there can't be no God so come with me instead throw your lot in with me instead yeah I will give you all the senses and wonders but he doesn't tell you the price of hell yeah so he keeps that a secret this is the art of deception and the job for you is to overcome the deception so in Dwapa Yu, the methods are a little bit more clever so there will be many spiritual paths formed and many so-called saints and masters come into being who teach say mindfulness techniques or lower techniques or the physical sciences or philosophy or sometimes even pretend to be masters which is a whole other subject um, and they are responsible for leading souls astray and because souls become more seeking in Dwapa Yug and they're not yet at that level where they could recognize the true from the false, they latch on to whoever they feel a connection with that could offer them something. And it's only after a certain amount of time that if they're true seekers, the Lord itself intervenes, because they can't with their own mind. The mind is just a computer processing data. But the Lord intervenes and creates within them as an awareness or an intuitive feeling that all is not right. Something is missing or something's not complete. And then that person is able to make better choices about who they follow and so on. So these are the ways that Karl affects the Dwapa Yuga and then in Treta Yuga and Sat Yuga it operates differently again, even in more extreme methods of deception. Thank you. Is Karl aware of the initiated souls in this creation or does he see all souls as equal and will try to tempt all of them? He does recognise initiated souls, but his mode of operation in them is different. See, Carl himself is a pre-programmed ego attribute. He's only doing what he's been trained to do. He has no, um, let's say, personal vendetta against anyone. 
He doesn't like or dislike anyone. He has no personal feelings about anyone. He acts according to the programming of his design, which is, whether a soul is initiated or not, to deceive them and to delay them as long as possible. Thank you. I'm going to go on to talk about saints and perfect living masters now. When pictures of past saints have been illustrated showing a ring of light around the head of the saint, was this because they were enlightened or is this what some people actually saw physically? Oh, the depictions of the masters um, with halos around them is purely um, imagination. You see, because masters refer to enlightenment as being enlightened here at, say, the Wisdom Eye Center or around this area, enlightenment incorporates the word light. So artists in the past um, drew a halo around them of light, or a light, originally it wasn't a halo, it was not a ring, it was a complete light in the background, like a rising sun, to indicate that person was enlightened. It's not because they saw that. It's because that is their artistic expression, and that later got refined to a simple halo. Mm. So no, it's not a, a physical thing that's seen, it's just an artistic in expression. Thank you. Does being in the physical presence of a master or enlightened one have some effect on our karma? For example, is it lightened? Very much so. Mm. When Master Gishi Dristi, and is of the highest order master, then definitely that lightens the load and we call this divine intervention for those fortunate enough to come into the company of such ones and also to recognize that company. Is it possible to see past saints when we go within? Most certainly, you can see anything you want. Anything that has occurred and will occur is recorded in the records within the astral realm. You can go back in time, you can go forward in time, you can look at the present. So not only can you look at past saints and see their entire story, which is what I had to do when doing some writing mm. to know the truth about the matter, you can see any aspect of creation. You can go right to the very beginning of when the mind first created the creation to the three deities. But only if it's written into your script? Yes. Okay. Everything is according to the script, yeah. but you don't know what is written, do you? Mm. So therefore, your heart's desire, or whatever is given to you as a desire, will make you go that way. And remember, whatever you desire, you can fulfill, otherwise you wouldn't desire it. No desire is given to you yeah. that cannot be fulfilled in some way. This is the really unusual thing. So if you desire, let's say, grandeur in the material realm, you may not get it right now, but you'll come back and have to get it, and that will trap you here. All desires must be fulfilled. But those desires are determined by your conditioning. So some people desire one thing, another desires another. Why the difference? Because they have different conditioning. So your desires definitely allow you to see what you want to see and not. Another one, like myself, did, wasn't interested in sightseeing in the lower realms, wanted to go straight to the soul realm. Wasn't interested, done it all before. Mm. You know? Another person says, yes, I want to see the saints, I want to meet Guru Nanak inside, I want to see Guru Gobind Singh, I want to see Jesus, I want to see this. Most says, okay, go on, have a detour. <laughs> yeah? And he's just given like that. Yeah. But he gives, holds a rope. He says, okay, I'm going to let you go so far, otherwise you get sucked into the whole thing. And then he pulls, tugs and says, no, come on, let's go, you've, you've had enough, mm -hmm. come on. Thank you. Right, I've got a question here for our guest speaker. What was the most well-known female saint that you can tell us about? Female saint? Yeah. Um, my first master, Supreme Master Xinghai. <laughs> she a lovely person. She's your master too. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, she's the one who introduced me to the light and sound meditation. So without her, I don't think that I'm going to come to know this higher part. Because in the East, um, in the Far East, it's very difficult to know about the technique of Surat Shabbat Yoga. I was searching all along and I went to different temples and ashram and all of their teach are mindfulness technique. That's not uh, something that I seek for. After I read her books, I decided to get initiation <coughs> and I really appreciate that 
and she translate all the teaching in Thai as well. So I come to know this higher part in Thai. Thank you. Is it? How many of the Sikh gurus were perfect living masters? Fuck myself. Mm -hmm. Well, should I be controversial here? Sure. Since this is all about the truth, then there are five Sikh or perfect living masters of the Sikh line, um, from Guru Nanak to Guru Arjan Dev, which is why their teachings were wholly passive, um, compassionate, loving, kind, non-violent and so on. And why Guru Arjan Dev himself proved a point by sacrificing his life, even though he could have escaped, like Jesus could have escaped, yet he sacrificed himself to be tortured and put to death by the uh, Mughal rulers at the time in India. And at the same time, before this, he commissioned the Adi Granth, the Sikh's holy book that comprises the basic teachings of the Gurus and the Bhagats, other associated um, movements of the Bhakti movement in India, to be included at that particular time, not at the end of the Ten Gurus, at that time. All these things point towards the fact that the line ended at then. Thereafter, the sixth Guru, Guru Hargobin, under the influence of his uh, military advisors and uh, more, let's say, aggressive um, uncles and uh, others, dawned something called Miri and Biri, which means the sword and the holy book together. So then they became Sikh warriors or military, a military um, spiritual organization that went down the route of fighting, seeking revenge and doing much like the Crusades did in Christianity. They took on the Crusader role, which is not the way of the saints. However, Sikhs believe that the Ten Gurus are supreme because they do not understand the difference between a Satguru and a Sadguru. You see, the other five were Sadgurus. They'd reached a point of enlightenment where they had some knowledge, but they were still subject to desire and uh, the, the mind, and the control of the mind and so on, and were led by this, which the former five did not have. There's a lot written about this, even by the scholars, and in fact there's a Sikh movement that believes only in the scripture, and it's called Sikhism through scripture, meaning that whatever the scripture says, rather than the historical account, that's what they should believe in. So there is a division among Sikhs growing, in which um, those ones who believe in all ten gurus, and believe in the dawning the sword and the martial arts and the fighting and all of that they follow one line or the cultural Sikhism that's been accepted by mainstream society and then there's spiritual Sikhism which usually follow up to the Adi Granth the book itself and follow the instruction of the book and under their line there's five gurus and the others they do respect them and worship and, and not worship them but do respect them and acknowledge them but they recognize that there's a difference in the approach of the latter five gurus to the former five. And the former five gurus are in line with all the Bhagats and all the saints of even today of the compassionate, non-violent um, and tolerant way of living and of getting out of this world rather than trying to change this world for the better. Thank you. Why are all perfect living masters, and this is a question for guest speaker, why are all perfect living masters so playful with us? They always joke around and are light-hearted. Should we also try to be like this instead of our constant complaining? <laughs> yes, of course. All the saints, all enlightened ones, they have a sense of humor, great sense of humor. They make fun of everything, actually. If you know them personally, they're like a child. They don't take anything seriously in this world. That's how they see the world. That's how they can always remain happy, childlike. Because this illusion, this world, the whole creation is like shadow to them. Why take all the shadows so seriously? It's just gonna go one day, right? Mm. But the long last happiness, when they connect with the Lord inside, 
make them happy forever. Thank you. I've got a few questions. Yes. Around. Sorry. You say that um, masters are playful and joyous all the time. In Supreme Master's recent video, she brought down crying because she was uh, emotional about Taiwan. So I, I don't understand what, why would she stop crying if someone was really. It's an act. Mm. It's a show. What's the purpose of the act? Because, because sometimes Chinese Sangha, they need a, a good show. Because they are very emotional people. So therefore, how they connect with the master are very emotional, sometimes very selfish love. So I saw one gathering where um, she walked among the aisle. Then, then Chinese Sangha tried to grab her and she almost tripped over. So um, that's, that's to show that they're very emotional. They're very like that kind of act is like a selfish love, not selfless love. They don't want to protect. They, they go there and want to get something from master. In order to put them right, sometimes master put, put on a big show. But after even if she cry in front of everybody, after she walk off, she just laugh. Because in our insane, um, insanely people heart, nothing is serious. But sometimes when they go up on the stage, they have to perform to be in a certain way, according to the people, according to the audience of that day. <laughs> okay, going on to family now, and this is for you, the main speaker. Is it okay to let go of family, negative family members and friends who you do not wish to communicate with, or do we have a karmic duty to fulfill, especially if they are always contacting us? Should we have boundaries? <coughs> yes, we should have boundaries. Um we should have our limits, we should not compromise our principles in any dealings we have, family or not. However, yes it is okay to steer away from negativity, but not to judge. There's a difference between recognizing negativity and saying it's not for you and judging. <coughs> Sorry. So if you judge, so shall you be judged. That is the moral of the story. Of so, yes, you have to fulfill your karmic obligations and duties. <coughs> Sorry, try it, try it. But we should have boundaries based upon our principles of life. We all have certain principles, some higher than others. So we should always follow our principles. Thank you. Question for guest speaker now. A family member recently died we have sent a condolence card from us all as family. One of us has contacted the deceased family via phone. We have been distant for many years. Is this okay as it won't feel authentic doing anything else? I don't understand the point of the question. Can you explain a little bit to me? Okay, so a family member has died mm -hmm. and have sent a card to say yeah. we're sorry you yeah, know, yeah, about yeah. your loss mm -hmm. and they don't normally associate with the family. They've been distant for a long, long time. Mm. But they have called them on the phone yeah. just to say, you know, we're sorry about yeah. your loss. Yeah. And basically what they're asking, is it okay to just do what they've done because they don't really feel like doing anything else, even though someone's died? Because the norm is to go and visit and mm. talk and say how sorry you are and just go through the motions. So... Mm. They don't feel authentic in doing all that. Yeah. That you, mean, is true. Do, you mean, do they pretend? Yeah. Is, that, is it okay to pretend? Well. So, um, yeah. in the principle of the precept. They just don't want to do anything. They just yeah. don't want to do anything. Yet. In the principle of the precept, we should do no harm to ourselves, nor that we should harm others. So, in order to um, have a good relationship or remain good feeling toward one another, do what necessary because I have been told that 
especially in the West, we are polite society. So we have to do what we must have to do, you know, in order to keep everybody happy. Okay. There's no harm in it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Last question to you, main speaker regarding family. Are our ancestors connected to us in this life and can they affect our influence us now? Not really. This is very much an ancient tribal custom in mm. which once somebody was buried, they were buried in a certain sacred way or in a certain site, and then people would go and visit the burial at certain times of the year to pray for their soul that you know they go to a better place, but also in some cases to ask them for help as intermediaries. Because it's considered that because they're dead, they're sitting somewhere between the physical world and the God. So they can intermediate, they can intercede, they can uh, act on behalf of the living. So certain offerings were made and certain requests were made for help, but also other times they were prayed for by the family to say, wish you well and everything, so that they can collect the favour back. So this idea of first wishing them well and everything's fine, because later at later, later date you'll call upon them for help, is how this whole ancestor worship came about. And so the answer is no, because once after 49 days mm. in the karmic court, the decision is made of what that's, where that soul is going to go next. And it, it breaks completely, entirely with its former life. Mm. Only a record is left in the astral record of that former life that you can see. So for example, a psychic or a medium can go and say, see Auntie Granny or, mm. or Uncle Tom or whatever. Um, what they're seeing is a reflection of the former self of the former existence, but not the actual being. And they can even interact with that being because the former self has a pre-programmed mechanism based upon their own life experience as how they would react. So they can actually create and imagine, because remember the first realm is a realm of imagination. So they can actually imagine that person saying something to them and take it that that's actually been done and it isn't in a, in a sense. So because of this, that people see people in the afterlife through this imagination process and the record, mm. they believe that these people are just hanging around waiting after death. Mm. So because of this, when it comes to ancestor worship and veneration, they think, oh well, you know, they're sitting there waiting to help us or whatever, or, or even to harm us. In some cases, they try to make offering to please that soul because maybe they're a bad person on earth and they think now they're going to seek revenge mm. <laughs> upon the family. So there's even that side. Yeah, so that's the whole reason why ancestor worship or ancestor recognition came about. Right. Sorry, can I ask a question yeah. related to that? Um, I was told that when you get initiated, mm. it affects like seven generations. Yes. yes. How does that reflect in reflect the ancestor? Because the ancestor veneration or recognizing your ancestor mm -hmm. to help you is a totally separate thing. Mm -hmm. What they're talking about is that they're somehow residing in the astral, hovering and waiting to serve us or to harm us. With um, seven generations have been rescued actually that's not even correct seven or five and like numbers are given the reason why numbers are given is because they want to give an a master want to give an idea of the collection of souls who descended with you so let's say a collection of 1000 souls descended from such kind to play the drama of your character each one has agreed as a job lot to play each individual role there'll only be a certain number of people that you meet in your life and those individuals the ones who form a closer relationship with you because they have more to do with you. You know, you can say five generations, seven, it includes friends as well, by the way, not just generations of family, close friends. Anybody's attached to you or somehow involved in your life personally, they can be saved. When that one individual in that whole collection gets initiated, it creates a, a domino effect across everybody. So eventually everybody will be brought into the fold. That's why masters emphasize so much the point about being initiated and accepted by living. And they bother even mentioning this. Why would they even bother mentioning this? Because it has no bearing on you whatsoever, actually, in this life. The reason they're explaining this without, in a very short form is to make you realize that uh, the entire collection that you've come with are automatically saved when one person is blessed. And that's the grand magnificence of this whole rescue plan. Can I just mention a thing about the ancestors? Because mm. it's not something that I look into myself, mm -hmm. but I was approached on some social media platform okay. about 
oh, your ancestors have something to tell you. Yeah. I just thought, is it just a marketing ploy or what have you? Could be. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. This is what I'm thinking. And I thought, but I didn't feel that call. You know, to Don't worry about it. Ignore it. Like I oh, said, it's, <laughs> it's most likely marketing because yeah. because they people have no belief system here in the West much. Mm. So you could throw anything at them. You could say crystal is calling you, the Mount <laughs> Elber is calling you, that yeah. tree over there is calling you. Say, oh really? Yeah. People get excited by these things. The Westerners mm. are so easily won over. True. That's why there's millions of cults in the West. Yeah. You know, all these belief systems, believing in all sorts of things worshipping all sorts of things they're clueless bless them yeah. it's all fun and people want a connection don't they? yeah they want to feel meaning in their life they want to feel purpose they don't understand it starts with them they don't need an outside agent True. but that's the way it's sold now because they think no we're useless we're this we're that we need some outside agent mm. okay. thank you i've got a couple of general questions and then that's all my questions here so if anyone's okay. got any questions they want to ask please get them ready um, is remote viewing the same as time travel and is it okay to protect our consciousness to other geographical locations in the present moment? Well, let me answer the first part first and then try to think of what the, the question is trying to get at with the second part. No, uh, remote viewing is different from time travel because time travel is actually getting there wholly. Whereas remote viewing is you're in one place and you're looking, say, through a telescope at a distant place. Mm. So it's not gone anywhere at all. You're just viewing, you're just viewing it. Yeah. Say, spiritually, you're able to look into, say, the future, or even even um, going to another place, another location, and, and astral project yourself there and have a look. So you can do remote viewing in that way. Time travel is actually getting into some sort of device and going there mm. wholeheartedly. So they're very different. Um, Second part was yeah, saying, yeah. and is it okay to project our consciousness to another geographical location in the present moment? This is uh, now they're referring to to astral projection. A lot of people um, practice astral projection as a means to explore the the uh, physical universe or the physical world um, through spiritual projection of themselves. This is a popular thing. From from an idealist point of view, from a purely spiritual point of view, it's not recommended because this is a great distraction to the real spiritual journey of going within. Because mm -hmm. what you're doing is you're using your spiritual ability to go out into the creation again. You're not actually going within. You're going in the opposite direction. So let's say you've lost something in the house, like a ring, but you go looking for it in the garden and you created a whole team of experts and metal detectors and everything. You'll never find it. You'll keep wandering around in the garden. How can you ever find the ring? So if we're looking for our truth, our true self, that lies within us, and we're projecting ourselves geographically elsewhere, how can we ever find truth? So whilst this is entertaining, yeah. from a spiritual point of view, a real secret, don't bother with it, because it can lure you into it. You can get so taken back by it that it can hold your spiritual progress back by several lifetimes, in fact. But those that do astral projection think they are doing something meaningful. Oh yeah, it's quite popular. Yeah, yeah, that's what I mean because they don't know anything else. And even if they have, they all know religion. They've, most of the people who do astral projection have heard of religion, have heard of God, have heard mm. of. It, but they choose because of their some scars, their their mm. their sensibilities. They choose a particular way of looking at the world, and they want to enjoy it that way. Mm. Thank you. I've got a couple of questions now around people. Sometimes we meet people for the first time and can feel a strong connection. Is this from our past lifetime? Most certainly. Um, any intuitive connection, any strong feelings that are not determined by factors, for example, you're not forced to associate by somebody, but you feel an instant sort of like or dislike for somebody, is from the past life. You have a previous association with them. <coughs> and they're brought into this life in order to fill the karmic connection between you two to complete that journey. So you just go with the flow, really? You go with the flow, and for whatever it, whatever it, however it turns out, you go along with it. But yes, it definitely a uh, strong connection is from the past life, not from this life at all. Okay. So my last question is, why do people like to judge others? Is this the wrong attitude? I guess. <laughs> 
I would cheekily say because they like to be judged. Hmm. Why would you judge another unless you want to be judged? For example, if you want to be judged as mighty and great, you judge those less than you say they're not mighty and great. Hmm. So the interesting thing is, and they would not immediately recognize this, it's a great deception because they like judgment, therefore they're happily judging others. They don't realize it's a two-edged sword. It can be positive or negative. So when somebody wants to feel that they're better than others, mm. or greater or higher status, they judge others as a consequence, mm. without realizing that that would become their lot in the end, after they've expired this period of grace they have. <coughs> so that's why people like to judge others without realizing. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions at all? You know, the third thing is your masters probably <coughs> at the moment. Do, mm. they, do they work collectively? Ultimately, from a higher perspective, yes. So why is it that they very rarely m mention each other in their satsangs? Or do they what, avoid mentioning? Yes, they are avoiding mentioning each other. <coughs> Sorry, I've just got a tickly throat. Um, the reason being is that human beings do not understand the collective oneness. So they do not understand that the Shabbat takes its abode in more than one individual, and therefore that Shabbat is manifesting to a particular people, a particular culture, a particular country, in a particular way. So when an individual sees a master operating in another part of the world, they say, oh, but this one is not the same as that one. There's a difference. They create differences. Masters operate from a point of view of oneness, but their expression may differ depending on the culture. So for example, let's say Supreme Master, as May says, operates in one particular mode, for her Eastern, Far Eastern Sangha, she has to, but her Western approach was completely different. When she was in the West, she acted completely different. She was very scientific, logical, explained, or in fact, the best explanations were while she was in the West. And when she went to the East, it went down the emotional route and other things. So according to the culture, I mean, Babaji of Bias, he has a particular way of expressing based upon cultural traditions, because most of his Sangha are Punjabi. So he comes at it from that point of view. Ishwar Puriji, being in the West studying psychology, he implemented a more philosophical, uh, intellectual approach to spiritualism. Ultimately, they're all telling you to go within and see for yourself, know thyself as soul. So the actual point of their message is the same, but the way it is delivered is different. So people um, do not understand that these differences are necessary because they're born in a particular culture. So they're thinking, why should masters, why should masters change their method of expression according to different cultures? They can't get that. They don't have that comprehension. So they say, oh, that one's different. I'm going to follow this one. So they choose, I think this one's all right, that one's not. Human beings make that distinction, not masters. And because masters know about this, they try not to talk about other masters to confuse the matter. Because if somebody's following a particular line and then somebody says, by the way, there's another master, the person will say, oh, I've got to make a choice now. Choices are always hard in human beings. Which one? Which is the best choice? <gasps> a dilemma. But if they have a natural pull or their destiny leads to a particular master, the master could just give the teaching. It doesn't have to involve personalities, getting involved in politics or personalities. Masters never talk about anybody, actually, not just other masters. They just leave that to the people to decide for themselves. Their job is just to give teaching and an explanation of how to go inside and see everything for yourself. They don't want to get involved because that opened up a whole can of worms. Why did they say this? The whole thing would be political. Why is it you're teaching this, they're teaching that? And that's what it becomes, a personality bashing rather than the truth. <coughs>